Good. Hello, everyone. This is Unraveled Hearts Bible Study, and we welcome you. If you happen to be spotting us right now, it is meant to be. I promise you, if you stick with us for the next hour, you will learn something tonight. If you happen to be in the San Benito, uh, Harlingen, Laferia area, come to the table. We have McAllen and Brownsville here. What am I talking about? So really, there's no excuse. If you're in the valley, you can come to the table. Be part of us. You'll have instant best friends and loads of good food. We, we, had, we had canes. We have shrimp cocktail. We had nuggets. We have everything, you guys. We have uh, some Filipino stuff. So anyway, it was pretty awesome today. And so the, we finished our discussion. Now we're going to jump right into Proverbs and, and, and then Numbers. But I want to let you know um, about us. We are the Bible Gypsies. We go from home to home um, every Tuesday night, a church, a business, any place that would have us. So if you want to host us in the future, just message me and we will get together. We will invade your space. And we will proclaim the word of God from your location. Um, we definitely need hosts. We have a ton of events. Um, go ahead and look us up on, on our public page is where we have all the events. And you just go to Unraveled Hearts. And you can see a bunch of women right on, the, on that first page. And we have leadership classes. We're going to have a leadership class November 23rd. And we have a spring uh, getaway that's happening in April. You want to jump in and plug into these awesome resources because it's going to help you learn the Word of God. It's going to get the Word of God in you. It's going to get rivers of living water flowing out of you. So we welcome you. And now we're going to plug. We're going to dive right in. Okay. So here we go. No, uh, Proverbs 11, verse 4. four. Yes, that's where we are. Okay, so we, um, I'm going to have uh, Miss Sarah read Proverbs 11, verse 4, and then we're going to unpack it together. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Okay. So these one-liners of treasure, okay? So I want you to look at this in verse in verse four, and I want you to to we're gonna we're gonna kind of unpack it, kind of dividing the 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 word of God um, in truth, right? So we're doing that with the Geneva, the King James, and the Living Translation. The reason I use these three translations is one, the Geneva Bible goes way back. It is the first Bible where people got a way to translate to Geneva because people kept going to, you know, at that time the Roman Catholics pretty much ruled, you know, and so people kept going to the priest and uh, for information on the Bible. They could not directly read the Bible. And when they escaped to Geneva and, you know, these men actually learned the Hebrew and the Greek and translated it into common English so that they could read it for themselves. And then they started realizing that they could go straight to God. So this caused an uproar and people were killed because of this. But the Geneva Bible actually came on the Mayflower. So it's one of the first Bibles. King James actually had, you know, a hissy fit about this. It can't be the best Bible out there. So a few years later, he gathered scholars and did his own translation, which is very close to the Geneva Bible. That's another good translation. Two, two solid translations. And then we have our common folk the Bible, which is a living Bible, and it's very down to earth. It's very easy to read. If you think like, I, I don't know how to read this. I don't know how, I can't understand this. If you start with a living Bible, the living Bible translation, it'll be real simple. And then you can dive into to more complicated translations or more accurate translations. Okay, <coughs> so the Geneva Bible says, Riches avail not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Okay, so a word there, avail. What does the word avail mean? Riches avail not. What does avail mean? If I say, I tried to reach him on the phone to no avail, what does that mean? No stopping. <clears throat> he was not reachable. He was, not, he was not able to be reached, where, right? Where Avail actually means help or, or benefit or advantageous, 
But if we put the word no or to no avail, then that cancels out that benefit, that uh, uh, you know, that advantage or that help, right? So right here, it's saying riches avail not in the day of wrath. Well, what does that mean? What is a day of wrath? That sounds really, you know, powerful, really Lord of the Rings type of stuff. Let's see what that means. Day of wrath actually means God's wrath. Okay, so the day that God administers his wrath, that is the, the day of wrath. So I'm going to give you about three different verses that talk or that confirm what I just told you. Let's go to Sephaniah, which he's hanging out with the, with the prophets. So if you find Isaiah, he'll be nearby. Sephaniah. Yeah, that's kind of a cool name, though. Next to Isaiah, before or after? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Is it before or after Isaiah? So let's all look. Song to Songs, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. So it's Old Testament. Zephaniah. Hi. Yes. It's a ugly it be more page after. number in my. So we got <laughs> Nehemiah. Then Nehemiah. Oh, Come on. Come on. Come on. I've never heard Naomi. of a cool name too. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, Mr. Naomi? That's your name. All right. Let, if, if you haven't found it, let's let Miss Cindy read it and, and just listen very closely. What is it? Sepha it's after Amos. Thank you, sir. Whoa. Oh, we fed him and he gave us information. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Okay. So, Miss Cindy, can you read that? Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18. So, chapter 1, 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. Okay. So now are we getting a clearer picture of the day of wrath? <laughs> it is God's wrath, right? And and this is a prophet that's, that's laying this out saying this is, this is what it would look like. This is what a day of wrath would look like. Okay, now let's go to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. We know that one, right? That's New, Test New Testament. Luke chapter 3, 7 through 9. So, Miss Miss Mirta, when once you're there, can you go ahead and read that? Now, I want to set this up. This is John the Baptist talking, okay? And, and and watch what he says. John the Baptist was a character, and he was just fearless, and he was a Jesus's cousin. But go ahead, Miss Mirta. Luke three seven through eight, uh, seven through nine. Sorry. Okay. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him. Brood of vipers <laughs> who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. 
For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, so he's talking about a day of wrath that we're all going to face. But imagine a pastor when people are like, Pastor, I want to get, I want to get baptized. And he says, you brood of vipers, you snakes. Why do you want to get baptized? Like you're evil. You know, that's what he's saying to them. And then he says, you have no fruit of repentance. If, you, if you're going to be baptized, like there has to be fruit in your life. There has to be, you know, there, the fruit of repentance that I'm a changed life, you know. If, if pastors operated with that concept, you know, it would be very different. People wouldn't be lining up. It would be like, okay, let me show me your fruits of repentance. Show me that you have changed and transformed. This is what he's saying. And he's saying, oh, you claim to be Abraham's sons, that you're related to Abraham, and that's why you think you're somebody, and you can come get baptized? He said, no. He can make sons of Abraham from these rocks if he wanted to. So it's it, it's really cool how how John the Baptist just lays it out, you know? And and how a lot of times we think, oh, because my grandfather's a preacher, or because I come from a long line of Christian, you know, I come I'm a I'm a Christian because I come from a long line of Christians. No, God doesn't have grandchildren. <laughs> you have to know him yourself. And so it's, 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 very, uh, it's very in your face. But he also says something interesting here that says the day of wrath, God's wrath, is that we, you know, so show your fruits of, of, of repentance so you will not be thrown into the fire. Okay, what do you think he's talking about there? The rapture or what? The rapture. Hell, right? If you're going to go into the, the, the lake of fire, therefore every tree... Watch this. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Right? So you can be thrown into the fire. So we start seeing the glimpses of hell now, you know, being talked about here. So, okay. So now we have Sephaniah, an Old Testament prophet. We have John the Baptist, New Testament, talking about the wrath of God. And then the last book of the Bible, Revelations. Let's go to 15. Fifteen nineteen, Miss Miss Sarah, can you read that? Fifteen nineteen. No, I'm I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, no. there's no nineteen. Fifteen. Fifteen. There's no. Yeah, fifteen. Fifteen. That's one's an eight. What was it? Five. Hang on. Let me go to five right away. Five. No. Ah, come on. <laughs> 59. Okay, hang on. Man, I should just write them out. Okay. Hang on, hang on. I am lost. I just try to keep it on one page. <laughs> What about 119? Okay. Well, the point is, <laughs> <laughs> write these things that you have seen and the things that you've taken place. So he's talking about the fi fire. Hang on, hang on. And his head is... Is that 1919? No. 1915? <laughs> Man, it was so powerful. I hate when I make these mistakes. 1915? Ah, there we go. 1915. 1915. I swapped okay. them. 1915. 1915. Go ahead, Miss Liz. Read it out. Uh, I had it in the Spanish one. <laughs> That's okay. Let me see. Our relations. It was uh, 1915, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this verse is talking about Jesus okay and there's a song that we sing that also you know demonstrates just God's uh, Jesus so powerful up in heaven but go ahead 1915 coming, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword so 
sword uh, which, uh, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron specter. He threads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God's Almighty. Okay, so it's talking about the wrath of God, having to do with the, again, day of wrath. It's connected. It means the same thing. And he's saying, yeah, Jesus is going to come and he's going to, you know, he's going to do this to the nations. And this powerful Jesus is going to be, you know, on the scene. And this is what's going to happen because the fearness and he's going to, you know, be used by uh, to uh, disperse God's wrath. Okay. So I want you to just kind of connect that from, it's always been like that, that this day of wrath or this, uh, the wrath of God is this powerful thing that you don't want to be part of. You don't want to be part of God's wrath. And we certainly on judgment day don't want to be thrown into the fire, right? So, okay, we get that part. Riches avail not. Riches are no help. They're not advantageous during the day of wrath okay now the next part so so there in the day of wrath that people will face whether in death through fire whether in death through hell or in in some people might be living when god you know has his wrath here on earth so whether he administers and you're here on earth a certain day but there's a big but okay the last part of the proverb says righteousness the last part of the proverb says the righteous will escape this look at that but righteousness delivereth from death okay so righteousness what is right what is it to be righteous holy, holy. holy. so holy. just God's good God. virtuous pure all these things that you're saying guiltless sinless okay now Watch this because it says that the righteous will escape this day of wrath. The righteous will escape this judgment of hell. Okay. Well, then we want to be righteous, right? So let's see what Jesus has to say about who is righteous. Go to Mark, Matthew. <sighs> Matthew, Mark. Go to Mark. Chapter 10. Okay. 17 through 18. 17 through 18. Okay. So Mark 10. 17. Who's there? Amen. Okay, Miss Lisa, you want to go ahead and read that? Mm -hmm. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Okay. So this, this kid or this, this young man is wanting to be a disciple of Jesus. And he's like, man, I want to follow you. Tell me, how do I, he just went through this ordeal where he had children jumping all over him. He had, he had a good time teaching everyone. And this, this kid must have seen something in Jesus that he's like, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. And he says, um, good teacher. And Jesus takes this moment to teach right here when he is asked that. Because he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. So he's saying he's saying i am god you know through this question he's basically saying you you know something you know who i am right and then he's also making a statement about the people he's declaring that he is god and then he's declaring something about the people people are not good people are not good only god okay so wow that that's kind of sad but let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. So it's right after we went to Romans, then it's 1 Corinthians, then it's 2 Corinthians. Let's go there to chapter 5, verse 21. Okay. 
Okay. And Miss Olivia, when you're there, can you please read that? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Sarah, can you read that one more time? Because her says to be right with Christ, which is good. That's exactly right. But there's the righteousness that I'm looking for. Go for it. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay. So God made Jesus sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God. So we can be righteous through who? God. Through Jesus. Through Jesus. Jesus is God. He was able to, to, uh, to do that for us. He's able to make us righteous. Okay? <clears throat> so no one is good but God. There's no way that none of us can be so perfect that one day you'll be called righteous. No. You will fail. Because man is not good. But through Jesus, we are righteous. Through him. Romans 5.19. So back up a little bit. This is a whole gospel right here. If we're explaining this verse, we're, it, this is the gospel explaining this verse. Romans 5.19. The good news. <clears throat> okay, Selena, can you read that? 5.19. Romans? Oh, Romans 5, 19. Um, <clears throat> For as though the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Okay. Amen. So one man disobeyed. Who was that? Adam. 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 And everybody sinned because of him. And then he says, but another man obeyed. Who is this man? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, second Adam, right? And through him, because he obeyed, everyone is made righteous. Okay? And one who believes in him is made righteous. Okay? So, so we, if in Jesus, are righteous through him, meaning we're delivered from death. We're delivered from this day of wrath. If you are in Jesus, Romans 6, 16 keeps us in check by reminding us about obedience. Let's go to 6, 16. <clears throat> and uh, Joanna, can you read that? Yes. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting... So chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, 16. Oh, my bad. I was on no fire. <laughs> Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either you are slave, uh, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Okay. <clears throat> So wh whoever you obey, that's who you're a slave to. If you obey the Lord, you're, you're a servant, a slave to the Lord. Um, if you obey, you know, uh, Satan, that's who you are a slave to. And then it says, um, of obedience, leading us to righteousness. So, yes, you are a righteous in Jesus, but as you continue to obey him and follow him, you, you become a servant of righteousness and you you are it's leading you it keeps leading you to righteousness does that make sense yes okay whoo had to get that out that was that was a little hard you guys okay because i want to make sure we're getting this now now the, the king james is is the same it only says profit not so like avail not the, the, the riches, now it says profit not. But the Living Bible says this, and this is where, you know, that's why I tell you be careful with translations because watch what it says. Riches won't help you on the day of judgment, but right, right living can save you from death. So it, it sounds good, but the reality, the, the meaning is lost. That's not what we're talking about. Right living, you mean if I pay my taxes, if I keep my yard done nice and you know i'm nice to my neighbors yeah. that that's no 
You cannot save yourself. That's the whole point. You know, you need Jesus. So it's the same verse that we're studying, Proverbs 11, 4. But in the Living Bible, it's just a different, it waters it down so much. That's why you have to be careful. Okay? Only, um, so the translation makes me nervous because it's so light. If you're not living rightly, there's no life so perfect that doesn't need Jesus. Okay? Only through him we are made righteous and can live rightly in the life and that, that, um, that to come because of Jesus. Only he can save us from death. Ezekiel the prophet knew this a long time ago. Go to Ezekiel 7.19. Ezekiel 7.19. And watch what he says. Oh my gosh, he could be saying this today. <clears throat> I mean, it is so... It so connects what we just studied in this proverb, okay? Ezekiel 7, 19. Go for it, Olivia. You want to read that? They will throw their money in the streets, tossing it like worthless trash. Their silver and gold won't save them. On, the, on that day of the Lord's anger, it will neither satisfy nor feed them, for their greed can only trip them up. Exactly what we've been talking about with this proverb. There's just so much. One proverb, and we dug and we dug, when you see that all of the definitions, all of the meanings are right here in the Word of God. You don't go find them somewhere else. The Word of God helps us understand the Word of God. Okay? So now um, I want to ask you, what great treasure do you see in this verse? Okay? Because there's stuff here for you. So I don't want you to be like, oh, that was, okay, that made sense. What, what, I want you to see it through your eyes and kind of share with us. This verse? Yeah. This one. E oh. Chapter 11, verse 4, oh. Proverbs. So you can't buy let, salvation. You mm. cannot buy salvation. And if you're at a church that's telling you you can, you need to get out quickly. <laughs> because Money you can't. Money is not everything. Right. Yeah. Money right. doesn't mean anything. But it's just, I think what happens so much is that, you know, bribery, I mean, you hear it all the time of people getting in trouble because they try to buy, or they buy themselves into mm -hmm. things, and, Positions. you know, those people mm -hmm. that aren't Christians, the day of wrath, they're going to be trying to pay mm -hmm. to get into heaven, or trying to, okay, what do I need to do, to do I look, I'll give you, you know, yeah. You see it in the movies all the everything. time, yeah. trying to buy them, you know, yep. to yep. save themselves, and it's not going to happen. Yeah, and only our love for God and the obedience to God mm -hmm. will count at yeah. the end. There's the trust and obey, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking I about know. trust I and obey. Trust okay. and obey. Very relevant right now. So, how? Let me ask you a question. How does world the, a worldly American mentality keep us from? fully understanding or living out this verse it's all about more 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 bigger better yeah. profits yeah and it's weird i had two people tell me because you know how i always fight with different things in my life and i had two people tell me like oh if you just get this job and you make more money then you just put more money into your church basket and you're good and i'm like what like I just thought it was so weird that two people told me like on the same day and I'm like, yeah. it does not work like that. Like, yeah, they just yeah. need more money to the church. Like, you're good. And so I'm now like, you oh, gotta show yeah. them this verse. Yeah, I think I just gotta, hey, you know Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Post-it notes. Like, put, put some money in here. <laughs> you knowing the good. word of God frees you, frees you in a lot of ways and gives you better understanding. So. Okay, so how does a worldly American mentality keep us from fully understanding or living out this verse? And it's, you know, they it's all understand. of this that we just mentioned. It, 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 um, this open-mindedness -minded, actually limits us. You know, this, this worldly mentality, it, it limits us from understanding the Lord, understanding what he wants from us. And it's not going to come through money or fame. It's going to come to, hey, I, I need Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, we lack prayer in, in, mm -hmm. in our homes. Mm -hmm. 
Period. I mean, that's that's bottom line. I mean, if we don't pray, we don't come close to the Lord. We're not close to Him at all. Mm-hmm. It's your relationship with Him. It's a relationship in in Jesus. Yes. Do we have a false security on the things of this world? Mm-hmm. Do we have a false security on the things of this <coughs> world? I would say yes. I think so. Mm-hmm. How so? Like everybody Explain. wants to be better than everybody. Everybody wants to be higher than everybody. You know, have better things, have, have more expensive cars, have you know bigger houses. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's that's not what it's about. Material things. It's not, once you get well, in the word more, yeah. like you see it. You need to and you start to see like wow why did I ever care you know like mm-hmm. yeah. now I really when I see someone with something I'm like oh good for you like you work yeah. hard you know and it's mm-hmm. just like I don't have it that's fine I have it that's fine like mm-hmm. it's nothing to do with anything I just see it this way something happens to me right now I'm not taking anything with me they're not gonna put the house in the graveyard they're not gonna put a car yep. in there with me so I think about it we live in a world that you can Material. insure a pizza what? what? Oh, you, yeah. can, you can get they pizza insurance. They got their name, whatever, happens. they'll take you a free one. Yeah. So we have this false <laughs> sense that <laughs> if we just give a little more, if we just, you know, have insurance for everything, <laughs> that everything's going to be okay because we got insurance, you know? Um, so it is the American way. It is the world that surrounds us. And um, so... Being grounded in the Word of God is so important because it's a, it's a whole other. It's upside down. The the <laughs> the kingdom of God is upside down, and very different from what we live. So, how can you safeguard your heart and mind from chasing after the wrong things? How can you ah, staying in the Word? Stay in the Word. Oh, come on, oh, and coming to Bible number classes. One. Number one. <laughs> Yes. That's a good commercial. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so stay in the word can safeguard you. Uh, staying with people that know the word, staying with people who love Jesus, because they will, they're not afraid to tell you the truth. They're not, you know, they they will lead you and point you back to Jesus. Right? All right. Okay. Well, that was a, a long appetizer. That took us a long time. <laughs> yeah, but let's go to number 22 because we got a lot to cover there. But I want to pray because I didn't pray right on the onset. Yeah. <laughs> you guys need to pinch me or throw something <laughs> at me eventually. I'm well, like, I thought you had pray. done it on your own there. <laughs> Quietly. Well, That's what I didn't say anything. pray all the day long. But the thing is. That we need to pray together as we do mm-hmm. together. But that's okay. We're really diving in now, so we're gonna pray. Spirit of the living God, Lord, we need your presence. We need you here, Father God. Things become hard or confusing mm-hmm. when your presence is far from us, God, and we need you to clarify things. We need you to shine a light on this book, God. We need you to speak to us clearly, God. We want to know you. That's why we're here, God. I pray that you help us, that you help our minds comprehend, that you uncover some truths for each one of us, that each one of us individually takes a treasure home, Father God. I pray that our heart will not lead us astray. I pray that distractions will not come in from the enemy or from our own thoughts about the worldly stuff. God, that we can focus. We dedicate this time to you, God. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. Shine a light and highlight places in our heart that need to be changed, that need to be transformed. We ask you, God, that you teach us, that you show us, that you unveil what we need to know tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Numbers 22. So, so Numbers 22, that's the chapter we're, we're going to be on. And so that's our meat and potatoes. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to, um, I'm going to really quick recap because I've got a lot of notes. And so I need to get jump right in it. Um, but basically, the, the main characters, the Israelites, Moses, okay, Aaron and Miriam have died Everybody, the first generation is dying off. Why? Because of unbelief. They did not believe God. 
to the promised land. Disobedience, even Moses is not going to make it to the promised land. Mm -hmm. He's going to stay behind uh, because of disobedience. So all of this is happening, but right before chapter 21, the end of chapter 21, he gave them some victories. He gave them some battles. Remember, they're not going through the king's highway. They're going through the rough terrain, the rocks, they're climbing. And even though it's hard, guess what this is making them? Stronger. Stronger. They're becoming warriors. They're becoming these strong, you know, the second generation is like, yeah, we can do this, you know? And so they're pressing forward into the promised land. The, the, the baton is about to be, uh, to be passed on to Joshua. He's still in training. As long as Moses is alive, Moses is still hanging on. Um, and he's going to make it right to the very end there. But this chapter is going to show us the protection of God over his people. Is going to show us about, you know, the curse, that word we've been talking about. And so we're going to jump right in. But what we're going to do tonight is set a stage for this chapter. Okay? So let's look. Let's look at verse 1. They have just had some victories, you guys. They've, they've done some things. God is like, okay, I got you in the, he's training them. He's training them. And so now in verse 20, ah, I forgot about that. Oh, no, that's right here. Okay. Chapter 22, verse 1. Let's have, ah, oh, Joanna is gone. Okay, Crystal, can you read that nice and loud? Yes, ma'am. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Okay, we're going to stop there, okay, because I've got a lot of stuff. Okay, so we're going to stop here at verse 1, okay, because my desire is that as we go through this chapter, that we don't leave any stone unturned, okay, that we're looking at everything. God is communicating to us through his word revealed by the Holy Spirit. So at a glance, this verse is merely informational. We can look at it and go, okay, he's simply giving us geographical uh, location. And, and most would go right through it, okay? But by now, we know better, okay? This far in, a, in our journey, it has become very clear that there is gold here that cannot be overlooked. And gold at every corner. The treasure that we have found throughout the word has been amazing. And it's helped us. It, it, it has helped us along, um, along the way. Always, always read the word with curiosity, you guys. Like a child. Ask Holy Spirit to point things out, okay, with his flashlight so that you don't miss things. So as he's leading you and he's got this flashlight and he might say, oh, look over there. Oh, I see gold over there. Let's get that. And so Holy Spirit will do that, but you have to ask, okay? Because those little nuggets of gold have helped us through challenging times in our lives, so let's not overlook a thing. There's something powerful here, so let's pay attention to this verse, because I really want us to get this, okay? And God help me, I want to be able to teach this in a way that is helpful to you. So. I'm, I'm really, I'm nervous about this because I want to make sure I, I, I can explain it in a way that, that, um, that transforms something inside of you. So there are plains in Moab. That In that verse, it says, in the plains of Moab. That stopped me dead in my tracks, okay? Because they're pitching their tents there. They're dwelling there. This is not just speaking regarding them physically their physical location but also our emotional and spiritual location okay let's think who are the moabite people okay this is a land of moab so the people there are called moabites who are they and how did they come to be a people and now a country that israel must deal with okay these are very important questions to ask because when you're inputting information in your GPS, you've got to know your current location. Like it asks you, you know, what location, right? And, and sometimes it's got that memorized, but you've got to let it know from this location, right? 
to make you where to, to get you where you desire to go. It's necessary to know where you're at to get to where you desire to go. Okay. What's your 20? This was asked of me uh, at a job when I was brand new when I was like, I don't have 20 bucks. <laughs> I didn't understand what he was talking about. What's your 20? And uh, you know, it's a walkie talkie talk for, you know, where are you at? And I didn't know, I was like, I don't have 20 bucks to give you. <laughs> so we need to know that. We need to know what our 20 is. We need to know where we're at so we can know where we're going and where we desire to go. So let's discover that. Let's find out our current location because this is a, spir a spiritual journey. We must get the 411 on that, on our location. What's their 20? Not just geographically, okay? Not just geographically, but spiritually. Not just them, but us, okay? God is doing something here that's teaching us in this very moment, okay? So where and why are you where you are? Okay, because I believe it, I believe this will speak to us um, about the importance of our spiritual current location. There was a lady at the dollar store, that uh, Dollar Tree, that stopped me and it was right before Shellax. I wanted to run in and out. Mm -hmm. And this sweet girl, gosh, she must have been early 20s. And she was dressed really roughly and, and just, you know, she had this desperate look on her face. And there's like all these other women that I looked kind of rough too, okay? <laughs> and all these other women, you know, looked nice. They looked put together. But she comes to me and she's like, do you have any cash right now? And I'm, I had no cash. I had my visa. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then she starts like, da -da 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 -da. this is what's wrong with my life. This is what's happening. Da -da 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 -da. You know, I, I don't have any money. I don't have diapers. Da -da 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 -da. And all this stuff comes out. And I don't know what went through me that I just said, sweetheart, you cannot be here next year. Like this has to change for you. This has to be a wake up call that you are not here anymore. You've got to tell yourself, how can you be here when you've got kids and, and something you're, you need, you know, and so I just went, Psh. and for some reason, I just went at her. Like, I just felt like, I, I just was like speaking into her future. Like, this is not who you are. Look at you. This is not who you are. You are better than this. And I just started pouring into her. She's just crying. And I said, we're going to pray right now. And I just laid hands on her and we started praying. And she's just weeping. And I said, I cannot give you any money right now. I'm going to give you resources. I'm going to send you here. And I, you know, I gave her different ministries that would help her with stuff. And here's the phone number. And here's my phone number. And da, da, da. She's like, thank you so much. But something inside of me just, you know, I think she needed to hear that at that moment. So I want to tell you the same thing. Even if you think you're at a great place in your life right now, like you cannot be here next year. You gotta be higher, go further, do more in Jesus. Um, so where and why are you where you're at? Spiritually speaking, that's the question of the hour. Let's dive in, okay? To find out, we've gotta go back to the beginning, all right? Lot, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this guy, Lot. Okay, he was a nephew to Abraham. We're gonna, we're gonna get his story. His story has made his way in this verse to teach us something, okay? And we're gonna learn about Moab and where they came from. So let's go back to the beginning of beginnings, which is Genesis 19. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here. That is good. <laughs> okay. So Genesis 19, we're going to go through this rather quickly, but I want to point out a few things, okay? So I'm going to say Genesis 19, 1 through 11. Selena, can you read that? 1 through 11. Yes. Genesis 19? Yes. <clears throat> now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. 
And he said, Now, behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, However, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. <clears throat> Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have had no relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you'd like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were wearied, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Whoa, okay? There's a lot there, okay? The, the, have relations with, they want to have sex with these men, is what, what that's talking about. That just kind of sugar Men with it. men? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was Sodom. So here we have that's where Lot. He for his daughters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so here we have Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, okay? Abraham walked with God. Abraham had a promise from the Lord. Abraham knew the Lord. And here's his nephew who kind of said, you know, I want to go my own way. Um, and so um, that is what, what what's happening here. So traces of men who walk with God or believed in the God of Abraham. Someone who was raised right, this was Lot, in, a way, in the way of Yahweh. Just, we see hints of that. Because when he parted ways with Abraham, he lived near Sodom. He went in the direction of Sodom, but he didn't live in Sodom. Now he's living smack in Sodom, okay? So not all is right, but we may be getting a glimpse of the man he used to be because he did go out to the men and say, you know, come to my house. Hospitality. He used hospitality. He was urgent. That means he knew evil was around, yet there he is, right? He knew evil was, it, it was too much for these guys, but there he is living. Like women who say, uh, it's best you don't hang out with me on the weekends. You know, they know. They know they've got some things that you don't, it's not good for you. And then he used some flatbread, you know? Those are traditions. Those were traditions of, you know, uh, uh, that glimpse of him knowing God, knowing God's people. And so it's like women who cuss like a sailor, but like a sailor but then go to church every Sunday right or pray before a meal so traditions traditions protection of the angels because these men you know the Word of God uh, it doesn't really s uh, specify uh, very directly but we know that these men were connected to the Lord divinely so they were angels so he was very protective of, of the angels yet he throws his daughters who are virgins or he was about to throw his daughters um, who are virgins so it was at his daughter's expense right so women who know there's a difference between godliness and worldliness but throw their life or their family or their children right into it anyway something is warped okay but let's keep reading okay Genesis 19 12 through 29 so we're gonna continue reading Joanna, can you read that 12 to 29? <clears throat> yes. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. 
Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who were to marry his daughters and said, Up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his son-in-laws to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains for the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to and it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small? that my life may be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zor. The sun has risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Um, then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and set Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. Okay, so a few things here that have just happened. When he was trying to get his um, sons-in-law out, they didn't take him seriously, okay? He was leaderless. He, they thought he was joking, okay? So this was not a people who feared God. There was also hesitation on his part. He hesitated. Mm -hmm. Then, after they gave him specific directions, you're going to go into the mountains. He said, no, no, no. Can we please go into this little town? So he was asked to go another way, even though he was being guided. Something is definitely wrong with Lot. Living amongst sin, allowing to surround your life with it, does that. Okay, and now the reason for us taking a very close look at this story, Genesis 19, 30 to 36. Crystal, can you read that, please? <clears throat> Lot and his two daughters left Zorah and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old. <clears throat> And there is no man around here to lie with us. Sorry. <clears throat> As is the custom all over the earth, let's get our father to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine. And the older daughter went in and lay with him. He was not aware of it when she laid down or when she got up. The next day the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I lay with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and lie with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also, and the younger daughter went and lay with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him ben -Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. Okay. Wow. Mm. So, yeah, these girls <sighs> had sex with their father so they could get pregnant, and then they give birth to these uh, two, two wow. boys that are now, are now. So, so I want you to see how it all comes about. Evil and sexual perversion took place 
came from a man closely related to Abram. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Several times Abraham tried to protect his nephew, even saving his life and rescuing him a couple of times. But ultimately, you got you to gotta see this. Ultimately, Lot had to make his own decisions. He made the decision to move his family near Sodom. He made the decision to raise his daughters there. They met men of Sodom. They were about to marry men of Sodom in times when it's an arranged marriage. So that means the father had to approve these men. So he was okay with his daughters marrying men of Sodom. He was willing to offer up his daughters to these strange men so they could have their way with them. He hesitated several times before leaving Sodom and he was married to a woman who looked back even after being set free, he wouldn't follow divine directions. In the very least, Lot is a questionable character who God had mercy on due to Abraham. But even though they left Sodom, that evil place that had such a profound influence on them that caused them to act and live wickedly. So we can see here that you can take the girl out of Sodom, but you can't take Sodom out of the girl. I wonder what decisions we are making that negatively are impacting the future of our children. Things that we see surface, that we won't see surface until years from now. So I had this uh, man uh, telling me there in this ministry, he was one of the principals in, in, this, in this ministry, he would always tell me, you know, um, my girls were really little and he would say remember Giovanna you're always teaching the girls something you just don't know what you're teaching them until later you know so so he would he would say that to me you're always teaching your children and then he would say the question is what are you teaching them what are you teaching them because they're always watching you um, because whatever it is will surface maybe not today but it will surface so here we are 500 years later in Numbers 22, 500 years later, and Lot's decision, the sin in that family, the wickedness they acted on, not trusting God, not waiting for God's direction, not following his plan, all of it now surfacing. The Moabites and the Ammonites are descendants of Lot. Moab means of his father. Benami, a.k.a. Ammonite, means son of my kinsman. So the Moabites are a residue of the sin from Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, and that's where they are standing. In, in Deuteronomy, when Moses is dying, he explains that, that actually the Moabites and the Ammonites are, were together at this time. These people became numerous, and eventually they had their own country, their own land, and the king, okay? But their evil, their evil start permeated their culture. They were a wicked people. That's why God wanted them destroyed. They were evil to, to this very day, 500 years later. So this is where the Israelites are standing on their land in Numbers 22, what is, where, where it says, on the plains of Moab. The, that phrase is loaded, you guys. I believe Holy Spirit made sure we didn't miss it. Because some of you are on the plains of Moab right now. What was the meaning of it? I'm sorry. Of Moab. Moab is of the father. And the other one, the uh, enemy. Son of my kinsman. So some of you are in Moab right now, the plains of Moab right now. You are spiritually standing on bad history, bad past, bad decisions, horrible beginnings, mistakes, a heap of mess, sin at every side, surrounded by wickedness, things that seeped in your life that some of which you had no control over, maybe generationally. Like Lot's daughters, you were never protected. Like Lot's daughters, because of your upbringing, because maybe sin was all around you and it was normal, it was a way of life for you, 
you made colossal big mistakes and you fell deep into sin. That revelation alone is powerful and brings us to, to a deeper level of understanding. However, that's not it. In that same verse, you guys, there's so much hope and encouragement. Let's read it again. <laughs> Numbers 22. Numbers 22, verse 1. Miss, well, Miss Sarah, can you read that? 22, verse 1. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Camped across from Jericho, you guys. Mm -hmm. Another powerful phrase. God was positioning them for a great entrance to the promised land. So though they were in a bad spot, uh, up ahead, just across, was Jericho. Most of us know that story, that great miracle that God did for them, you know? So God's instructions to Joshua as, as they come um, closer to the promised land is you're going to march around um, Jericho for six days, one time, but you're going to be quiet. You're going to be quiet. You're going to march around, march around. The seventh day, you're going to march seven times, and then you're going to have all the worshipers went first. At, in every army, the worshipers went for it, which speaks volumes about worship. And so the, all these people with instruments were at the front. As soon as you hear the instruments, the trumpets go, you start shouting. And in that shout, God was to do something powerful. We're going to boom, boom, boom. Joshua 6.16. I want Selena to go there. Uh, Joshua 6.20. Miss, um, Miss Cindy, will you go there? And then Joshua 6. 26 through 27, Joanna. So we are going to Joshua, which is a little, just a little further from uh, from where we're at in Numbers. 620. Joshua chapter 6, <coughs> verse 16, Selena. Okay. So this is, I told you kind of, I set it up for you. Um, you know what's happening and then Selena's gonna gonna show you in scripture just in case you haven't really read the story for yourself all on chapter 6 yes everything's gonna be in chapter 6 at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets Joshua said to the people shout for the Lord has given you the city okay so that seventh time the trumpets went off and Joshua said you know shout the Lord uh, shout to the Lord, God has given you the city. Joshua 6.20. Who's got 6.20? So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him, and they took the city. Okay. Now, this city, the walls were so thick, that chariots rode on the wall. That's how thick they were, okay? And so just with the worship, the shout, the walls came tumbling down and laid flat, the word of God says. Now, Joshua 6, 26 through 27. Alrighty. Watch this, listen to this. Then Joshua made them take an oath at that time saying, cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds this city Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Okay. So Joshua cursed that anyone to, who was going to rebuild Jericho would lose their children. It would it would just be awful. Like that city could not be raised, and eventually that that happened. So great victory in Jericho. The plains of Moab are juxtaposed with this great victory of Jericho. Just across from them, the victory to come out right in front of them. I don't want you to miss Jericho for Moab, okay? I don't want you just to look at the ugliness or the ugliness that may be around you and miss Jericho. I don't want that to happen. I don't want you to miss what is right in front of you that God desires to give you. Victory that lies ahead as you walk in obedience. 
because they had to obey God for Jericho to take place, for the miracle of Jericho to take place. I don't want you to miss that because of where you're standing right now. You may be standing in the plains of Moab, but be encouraged because God has given you the city. Yes. He may just be setting you up, positioning you for a great victory. Amen. Israelites had to cross through those plains. There was no way about it. That represented such ugliness, surrounded by people who were idol, worship, idol worshipers and perverse to get to Jericho. Those things in our lives that are ugly and hurtful, painful and challenging are necessary parts of our growth to get us where we need to be. There may be many Jerichos up ahead for you. So do not be discouraged. Walk in obedience. Amen. We're going to finish with these two verses and then we're going to pray. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. This is Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. And I'll have Michelle read that. Michelle has it. What was that? 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gave us, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Through Amen. Jesus that we have Amen. that victory. And watch this. This is what I keep telling people. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. Miss Lisa, go for it. For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Crystal, once you get there, I want you to read it again, because this is powerful stuff, you guys. I want you to leave with that. I want you to leave with this. I go like, did I read the wrong one? Ephesians 2.10. No, you read the right one. Yeah. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay. God prepared it in advance for us to walk in them. It's already been done. It's already been prepared. It's already set. It's waiting for you to just walk in it. You know, I, I think about just the preparation of events and all that takes place and how every little thing and then the blessing is for the ones that come and they just walk through. Everything's already been set. All you have to do is show up. That's what he's saying. All you have to do is show up. Just walk through it. I've already opened doors for you. I've already prepared. And I go before you. Amen. The victory is ours. We just have to walk in. Amen. Amen. Okay? If you have not decided to follow Jesus meaning you haven't surrendered your whole life to him, given him full control and repented, then you can't even walk out of the, out of the plains of Moab. But, and this is a big but, if you are tired of pitching your tent in the plains of Moab and desire so much more, then so much more awaits for you. You can, you can follow Jesus. Amen. All you have to do is surrender and repent. That's all it is. Repent means to change your mind and go another way. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you because you see us. You see where we're at. You know, God, our exact location, even when we can't find ourselves, God. Even when we don't know where we are, God, you know us. You know exactly what we're going through. You see us. And Father God, even from the plains of Moab, you reach out to us. You make a way where there seems to be no way. And you prepare 
victory after victory ahead of us, God. Help us to see that. Help us to know that, God. Father God, I pray for anyone within the sound of my voice that has not surrendered to Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you will help them to see, to believe, to know that you are the Son of God and that through you is eternal life and that they can become new and they can begin again in you, Father God, that they can become righteous through you, God. I pray, Lord God, that that speaks to their spirit and they surrender and they stop fighting and they repent, God. I pray for repentance. I pray for fruits of repentance, God, as we walk towards you, as we press towards you, God as we keep obeying and trusting and moving forward, God. I thank you, God, for all that you do. I thank you, God. Holy Spirit, continue to have your way in us. Continue to lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Trinity, can you take us off live, Trinity, please? Thank you. Any comments? questions if if holy spirit is stirring something in your heart right now um share you're welcome